Hello, my name is Michael, and welcome to Game Domain. Today, I'll be counting down the top 10 Naughty Dog video games. Number 10, Crash Bandicoot 2, Cortex Strikes Back. Taking place on a fictional group of islands near Australia, Crash Bandicoot 2 follows the adventures of the anthropomorphic Bandicoot Crash. The goal of the game is to gather 25 crystals for Crash's nemesis, Dr. Neo Cortex. Crystals are scattered between 25 different levels accessible via warp rooms, which are hub areas of the game. Although Crash Bandicoot has been nearly everyone's favorite game from childhood, this sequel is not something to be held up high and proud of. It follows a similar scenario to that of the prequel, though the story is uniquely different, but we really can't say the same for the gameplay. Number 9. Uncharted, Drake's Fortune. The Drake's Fortune subtitle is a reference to the fictional main character Nathan Drake, who believes himself to be a descendant of famed explorer Sir Francis Drake. A 400 year old clue in the coffin of Sir Francis Drake sets the modern day fortune hunter on exploration for the favorite treasure of El Dorado, leading to the discovery of a forgotten island in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. The search turns deadly when Drake becomes stranded on the island and hunted by mercenaries. Outnumbered outgunned, Drake and his companions must fight to survive as they begin to unravel the terrible secrets hidden on the island. While the gameplay hasn't held up as well as its successors, it is more focused on combat than climbing. But for a third-person shooter from 2007, the aiming was very good. Uncharted has you solving puzzles, running through buildings that are hundreds of years old, and fighting waves of pirates. Number 8, Jack and Daxter, The Precursor Legacy. Jack and Daxter, The Precursor Legacy is the first installment in the Jack and Daxter series. The game follows the protagonist, Jack and Daxter, around 10 years after Jack and Samuel's Hey Guys arrival in Sandover Village after the conclusion of Jack 2. Centers upon their mission to stop the legions of lurkers from destroying the world with Dark Eco. The game features many platformer challenges with elements from the action and adventure brawler genres. Players are required to collect precursor orbs and power cells in order to further northward progress. This dialogue heavy game is full classic puzzles and item collecting systems going on. In terms of gameplay, it isn't the most unique one out there, but it strikes us as an event bandicoot game in a sense that it's a bit more free. And while it only gets 8th place on the list, it certainly wins a spot in the top 5 of childhood games. Number 7, Jack 2. Following the events of Golan Maja, Jack, Dexter, Kira, and Samos have been trying to unveil the mystery of the precursors to the use of machine. However, pressing the wrong button sends them into a dystopian city where Jack is taken prisoner by Crimson Guards, workers for Baron Praxis, and Dexter is left to find a way to get his friend out. During the two years, Jack has been exposed to the dark eco that was being tested. Thankfully, Daxter rescues Jack, though he was surprised to see what happened to his friend. Jack now must exact revenge against Baron Praxis, as well as uncover a new evil about to erupt. When it comes to expectations, sequels have the most burden. The success of the previous game has made it heavy for this game to achieve fans' expectations, and they've done that by introducing combat systems into the gameplay with plenty of monsters to fight and bosses to defeat. Number 6, Jack 3. Banished, left for dead, but this hero refused to be forgotten. Jack and his faithful companion Daxter are exiled to the unforgiving wasteland, where survival of the fittest is the law of the land. But deadly lands and dangerous creatures are only the beginning. Soon the worst nightmare imaginable finds Jack's world, threatening to annihilate all life with external darkness, a darkness Jack knows only too well. Jack's exciting trilogy comes to a close, leading at last to revelations about the mythical warrior Mar, secrets to Jack's animatic past, and ultimately to the shocking revelations of who the precursors really are. While there isn't much going on with the third game, new things have certainly been introduced, such as a more quiet scene, better graphics and animations, and now they've added a tank driving experience into the game. The atmosphere itself is what adds to the experience. The added difficulty of fighting baddies in a sandstorm is quite the challenge. It certainly is deserving of 6th place. Number 5, Crash Bandicoot 3, Warped. The evil Dr. Cortex is up to no good yet again with a new band of henchmen for you to defeat. Crash and Coco travel through numerous periods of time with Tropy's time twisting machine. The time twister consists of two hub rooms, the first one containing five chambers, each of which containing six portals, each leading to a different period of time, including medieval times, prehistoric times, ancient Egypt, and last the future. It's always good fun when an old game is released a newer version. It's exciting what we get to see our favorite game characters make it back into our game system again. The music itself is deserving in the first place in this nostalgic category. Not much is different with the gameplay apart from the boss fight, such as the time when Crash fought Ding a Dial, but who could really complain when we love playing old games with new scenarios and stages to complete? Number 4, Uncharted 3, Drake's Deception. Fortune hunter Nathan Drake is catapulted headlong into an adventure that takes him on a daring trek into the heart of the Arabian desert in a search for the fabled Atlantis of the Sands. This journey pits him and his mentor Victor Sullivan against an organization created by Queen Elizabeth and his ruthless leader. When the terrible secrets of his lost city are unearthed, Drake's quest ascends into a desperate bid for survival that strains the limits of his endurance and forces him to confront his deepest fears. While the graphics don't look amazing now, in 2011 on a PS3, it could be argued that Uncharted 3 has the best graphics on the system. We often 
can argue whether it's important or not in the game. While the gameplay and story is much more powerful, we couldn't have helped but admire the amazing graphics. We still can see the remnants of the old time 3D modeling, but Uncharted 3 has certainly taken it to the next level. Uncharted 2, Among Thieves. After being tracked down by Harry Flynn, Nathan Drake goes on a quest for Marco Polo's lost fleet. However, when things take an unexpected turn for the worst, Drake must rely on those closest to him in order to find the Sintamani Stone. Decent graphics, great quality voice actors, good animations with the slightly clunky controls. Whatever your verdict may be, you cannot argue that the new take in the story is absolutely mesmerizing. 2. Uncharted 4 A Thief's End Several years after his last adventure, a retired fortune hunter, Nathan Drake, is forced to go back into the world of thieves. While the stakes much more personal, Drake embarks on a globe-trotting journey in pursuit of a historical conspiracy behind a fabled pirate treasure. His greatest adventure will test his physical limits, his resolve, and ultimately what he is willing to sacrifice to save the ones he loves. As technology grew, the animation and graphic of the game certainly grew as well. Players are pulled in and feel more immersed in the game, with personal conflicts going about. Personal conflicts has never failed to make the audience that much more closer to their beloved gaming characters. Number one, which I'm pretty sure most of you guys expected, which is The Last of Us. 20 years after a fungal infection obliterated most of the US population and turned the victims into infected monstrosities, Joel, the main character, is tasked with escorting Ellie, a young girl, to the Fireflies to help reverse engineer a cure. However, this isn't easy for either of them, since Joel has been left almost permanently bitter after the death of his daughter, and Ellie is distrusting of him. And why wouldn't we choose The Last of Us as first place of the winner of our countdown? The first scene itself is an Oscar-worthy performance, and everyone can agree with that I'm sure of. With the fantastic story and memorable characters, that's what makes games like this one worth the time to play. This isn't just the best Naughty Dog game, but one of the best games of all time. If you agreed to our list or just agreed, let us know by commenting. Thank you for watching, bye, and have a wonderful day. Hello guys, welcome to Game Domain. This video will be counting down the top 10 things Nintendo fans hate. I just want to put it out there guys, this list is not to spread hate towards Nintendo. We're just listing some things that Nintendo has done or is doing now that fans are, aren't particularly strong or they don't really like it. So number 10 is delays. Delays can be good or bad, but when you delay it for more than two years after the original plan launch, it gets annoying, obviously. Nintendo does this all the time. One of the most notable games is Zelda Breath of the Wild. First, it was supposed to be released in 2015, then 2016, and now we finally have a release date, which is March 3rd, 2017. Number 9, lack of online social features. This one will probably change with the Switch, but for now, Nintendo has a very minimal online service. On the Wii U and 3DS, there is Miiverse. However, there is no voice chat with friends, no parties, no video clip sharing, and at least for most games, excluding Smash Bros. Wii U and Mario Kart 8, there are no achievements. Now guys, I gotta say that in Nintendo's part, this is very wrong of them, I do hope they improve on this, is, you know, most of the, uh, you know, we have everything on computer, we have Discord, Skype to communicate, and there's the, you know, Xbox and PlayStation both have achievements, they both have their own party chat system, so in my opinion, I really just think it's foolish that Nintendo hasn't done this, so far. Number 8, 32 gigabytes on the Wii U. Most games on the 3DS aren't that big to download, and you most likely have a slightly bigger SD card somewhere on hand, probably, you know, probably that you could use with your 3DS. But the Wii U has a lot of games that are fairly large, and while you may have some flash drives, there's a good chance that none of them are larger than 64 gigabytes. If you only want to download games and don't buy, want to buy an external storage, you might be able to download two major games. Now, guys, with most consoles, the Xbox, I'm not quite sure about the PlayStation, but I know for a fact the Xbox, the new Xboxes are up to a terabyte in storage, and uh, this is another reason why Nintendo is somewhat behind in this, having 32 gigabytes. I mean, most phones... Overwatch is a great game, with many characters to choose from, most are pretty balanced, but there are a few that are just completely overpowered. These points will be based off of the Xbox version of Overwatch. Also, this is just our opinion, so if you disagree, please let us know by commenting. Number 5, Bastion. Now Bastion does have 300 health, and his main weapon is balance. But Bastion can quickly heal himself at any time, very quickly, which is very annoying, especially if he is using his minigun, which can mow down a Roadhog in seconds, unless you're a Genji, which will most likely kill you within 2-3 to three seconds of being hit by the minigun. Next is Bastion's ultimate. Before you comment saying how all ultimates are OP, Bastion's is broken. 
you can kill multiple enemies with one shot and usually it only takes one shot to kill enemies. There's a reason why m the majority of the play of the games go to Bastion. Number 4, D.Va. D.Va does not have the most powerful attack. If her health was lower and she had to reload, she would be pretty balanced. However, in addition to her 600 health, once she loses that, she's still alive, second life. D.Va is much faster after she loses that 600 health, or in other words, after she's out of her mech suit. Also, her ultimate is just completely broken. It has a huge range and usually gets triples or even quadruple kills, which makes it pretty much a nuke. Number 3, Widowmaker. Like any first-person shooter game, the sniper can easily get one-hit kills. On PC, when someone is playing as Widowmaker, you know there's going to be some trouble. But on console, it's not that bad. But still, it barely takes any time to get a one-hit kill, and even if someone is too close, sniping won't work, yet your gun can turn into an assault rifle, which also makes it good at medium to uh, close quarters combat, which many other snipers in other FPS games do not have. Number 2, Roadhog. Roadhog is another character with 600 health. He can also heal himself, and he has a hook attack where he grabs an enemy, and it's pretty much a guaranteed kill with any enemy with 300 health or lower. So, right off the bat, Roadhog is a pretty viable choice for any new or inexperienced players. His gun is also very powerful, and since he does have 600 health, it makes him very difficult to kill when no one else is helping you. Number 1, McCree. McCree is known for being undefeatable in duels. His fan hammer attack is broken, especially when you follow it up with a flashbang, and Deadeye, which is his ultimate, is similar to Soldier 76's ultimate, except it's a lot more powerful. If you're in McCree's vision during Deadeye, good luck. McCree is completely broken. Thank you for watching this video. Do you agree or disagree with this list? Let us know by commenting, and if you also have any more picks for this list, say it in the comments down below. Thanks for watching, and see you next time. Hi, welcome to Game Domain. This video will be counting down 10 reasons why you should buy a Nintendo Switch. My name is Michael, let's start off. Number 10, Joy-Cons. The Joy-Cons are kind of like the Wii Remote, but it has a lot more features and is much smaller. It also has motion controls, NFC reading, and writing, a sensor that can tell what shape something is, and you can attach and detach the Joy-Cons to the Switch, and there's always a ton of ways that Joy-Cons will be used to enhance your gaming experience. Number 9, 1-2 Switch. 1-2 Switch is basically the Wii Sports for the Switch. It's a party game where you have to do actions such as pretending to answer a phone or sword fighting, and you have to do the action before the other person. If it is something like sword fighting, then it tracks the motion of the controller, similar to the sword fighting in Wii Sports, which we all know and love. 8, Legend of Zelda, Breath of the Wild. If you don't have a Wii U, but want to play Breath of the Wild, you can get a Switch, and you can play it on the go. With improved performance and graphics, Breath of the Wild seems like one of Nintendo's most ambitious games ever. There's a huge open world, realistic physics, over 100 shines, and so much more. An open world game like that, with a better quality, is exactly what Nintendo needs to get more people buying the Switch. Actual third party support. The Switch's third-party support is likely to end soon after the PS5 and the next Xbox come out, but for now it is getting games like Skyrim, Sonic Mania, and Steep, and there are over 80 games in development. Skyrim's a classic, guys. That's going to be a great game if that's on the Switch. 6. Super Bomberman R It's been quite some time since the last Bomberman game, and Super Bomberman R is coming to the Switch on launch day. There can be up to 8 players, locally or online, and this seems like a must-have for any fan of Bomberman or strategy games. It will be locked at 30 FPS unfortunately, which considering the graphics in the game, doesn't look that good, and it's not a demanding game by any means, as you guys know. 5. Cartridges are back. In the 1990s, cartridges did not have a lot of storage. However, now, cartridges can have a lot of storage, and there are much faster loading times. You don't have to download the games, even though you still can. 
Personally, I'm a little bit skeptic about this, considering cartridges are of the past and bringing past things back hasn't always been and doesn't always work out very well. In my mind, this would be like bringing, for those of you know what they are, cassettes or possibly even eight tracks back into cars. Only time would be able to tell. Super Mario Odyssey. Mario Odyssey is a return to the more open Mario games like Sunshine and 64. It has beautiful graphics and there are a bunch of unique environments such as a city, a weird level that seems to be food based, and you travel by flying hat. It's been way too long since a Mario game like this and Super Mario Odyssey will end that waiting. 3. Virtual Reality Nintendo hasn't showed any VR yet, but they have said that they are working on a way to make sure the Switch VR doesn't cause us nausea. They have filled in patents for the VR. Imagine how cool it would be to play a first person Metro game in VR. Now I'm glad Nintendo is doing this because a lot of developers have been doing VR now and it has been pretty popular, albeit expensive. So this could be another big selling point if this comes out in the future. 2. ARMS ARMS is a game where you use the Joy-Con's motion controls to attack the opponent. However, there's a twist. Your arms can extend so you can attack from a distance. By doing a block action with the Joy-Cons, you can block in the game. And finally, number one. You can play games on the TV and on the go. The Switch itself has a 720p, 6.2 inch capacitive touchscreen, and the Switch dock outputs at 1080p. Even when you're playing on the go, there are still home console quality graphics, and since there will be third party support, you can play games like Skyrim on the go. Let us know your thoughts about the Nintendo Switch in the comments. Thanks for watching, have a wonderful day, and goodbye. This is Jimmy from Game Domain with the top 10 indie games of 2016. 2016 was a fantastic year for independent games. Indie games are usually original, surprising, and carry a lot of gameplay for your dollar. If you usually overlook indie games or think they're all terrible copycat games, here's what you miss in 2016. Super Hot. Super Hot is one of the reasons that indie games are so great. No one in a major game studio would have thought, hey, let's make bullet time the game, much less let's take bullet time the game and make it even slower, but that's pretty much what Super Hot is. Time only moves when you move. Super Hot took that simple idea and slipped it into a sleek, stylized first person shooter. It takes a genre that usually rewards fast reflexes and using cover and turns it into something that is both contemplative and more aggressive. Instead of leaving a traditional trail of bodies, you're engineering a gravel road made out of bad guys faces. You're writing out a protractor and a surveying tripod to calculate the distances and times involved in connecting implements of violence with punk's bodies so you can execute a precise sequence of mook shattering moves. If you do it right, you will feel like Robert Downey Jr.'s Sherlock Holmes, and that's a great way to feel. Super Hot is the kind of game that delivers an original idea very well, and while direct imitators have came out, the mechanics are probably going to be seen in non-copyright first-person shooters from this point forward. I'm not saying bullet time is coming back, bullet time is just an easy aim mode inserted at random in a firefight. Super Hot's core mechanic promises creative movements designed around players thinking their way through frenetic firefights. It might just be the new turret sequence where it's thrown in to break up boring repetitive gameplay in bad games that will absolutely happen. But it's also going to be a good tool in the toolbox for good game designers. The Westport Independent The Westport Independent isn't fun in a traditional sense. You run the Westport Independent, a newspaper in an unnamed country where the government is about to seize control of all media. As the editor, you choose which stories you want to tell and which reporters will write them up. You can't report on every story, so the act of choosing which stories you print is inherently editorial. And if you write about government abuses, your reporters and you are at risk from the government. But when you aren't critical of the government, the rebels think you're being too friendly and still in danger. After 12 weeks, the consequences of your actions are shown and you're either satisfied with that or you're not. You get to see how the lives of your reporters and the Westport Independent turn out. It is a great game, not just a great indie game, because it gets back to the roots of what makes video games great. Heroism. Nothing is more heroic than going up against an evil, violent, faceless empire armed with nothing but a printing press. Hyper Light Drifter. Hyper Light Drifter is my pure nostalgia pick for 2016. It was kickstarted back in 2013 by Alex Preston and finally released this year. 
It's an art project. Alex Preston has a heart disease and wanted to make a game to communicate that to other folks. I can kind of see the threads of something as big, rich, and fragile as life distilled into Hyperlight Drifter, but really I was too deep into the gameplay. The gameplay is like if Zelda was just a bit different. The series had made some great games, but Hyperlight Drifter is the original 8-bit promise realized. It's tight, versatile, varied, and challenging. I always felt like a powerful figure fighting other powerful figures, and the best encounters left me feeling like one slip up would send me tumbling on a knife's edge. There's a period between when you've got a skill down and when it becomes tedious, and Hyperlight Drifter kept me in that range more than any video game in a recent memory. It's a video game. Capital V, capital G. Punch Club. I really like Punch Club and I don't know why. I hate grindy role-playing games and Punch Club is a grindy role-playing game. I loathe 80s references that lack a certain flair and Punch Club lacks that flair, but I really whipped my little boxer named whatever into shape. And I exercised him and did all jobs with him and learned the way of the bear until I almost fell asleep at my keyboard. It's charming almost in spite of itself with its obvious references and simple characters and the way it undercuts its own dramatic themes. I mean that in a good way. It's unpretentious. Punch Club is a great game and you could get a beer with it. And the payoff for Punch Club's grinding is impressive. Duskers. In Duskers you have a spaceship and you dock with derelict spaceships and send probes on board to explore them with keyboard commands. Your clumsy bots give you limited information and have to plan around dangerous monsters and power outages to salvage everything you can before moving on to the next ship. The most obvious reason to like Gusters is that it acquaints laypersons with basic concepts of computer logic and coding, and that's great. Everyone hates obvious, cloying educational games because they're not really games. They're flashcards with a lot of extra steps. Duskers is actually a good game. It's also a typing teacher. It's been almost 20 years since Typing of the Dead came out, and it's high time another game added to the threat of gruesome bodily dismemberment to the toolbox of people trying to teach junior high students basic computer skills. But aside from any irrelevant interest like increasing computer literacy, Duskers is cool. Every other game in the universe makes hacking into some pipe dream minigame, and it's procedurally generated, and it does not do that thing that other procedurally generated games do, where I'm left feeling like either the game generated enough supplies for me to live on, or it didn't and I'll die while the game is shrugging at me, pointing at the random number generator. But even when I die, I still kind of enjoy seeing all the ways I can misspell clothed A-1 hyphen before I'm ripped apart by a space monster. Tharsis. When Earth receives a mysterious signal from Mars, we sent six astronauts on the ship Iktami to investigate. A series of micrometeor strikes destroys the mission's food supplies, kills two of the crew, and causes a series of cascading failures across the ship. You have to keep the crew alive and the ship functional for 10 weeks until you get to Mars. As more failures plague Iktami, you have to assign crew to affected sections to resolve them. If you don't, either the ship will lose integrity or your crew will take damage. The crew's hunger, stress, and health are consistently chipped away and it's necessary to assign them to Iktami's various sections, sometimes non-damaged ones, to manage them. Firewatch. Yeah. Walking Simulator and Oscar Bait Firewatch. The gameplay is that instead of turning the page when you hear the tone, you interact with objects or use your radio to hear the rest of the story. But it's a damn good story, and it's well executed. The stories in most games are either there to support the gameplay, they're tacked on in an attempt to create emotional investment, or they're just non-existent. Games should have whatever story they need to make them work. Doom doesn't need a story about early onset dementia. Firewatch does. It's quiet and contemplative and well-placed. The long walks let the player's mind wander within the game to engage with the same intensity as any bullet hell shooter, but in a completely different way. And it couldn't do that if it wasn't beautiful, well-written, and well-voice acted. Rich Sommer and Sissy Jones both deserve some kind of award for their work here. Everyone involved does. Maybe not Oscar, but something. Stardew Valley. 
Stardew Valley is a farming sim. Farming sims exist to waste time, you know, like most games do. Most gamers hate farming sims not only because of the basic contempt for casual gaming, and Farmville specifically, which is worthy of contempt on its own merit, but because they're repetitive. They lack physically challenging gameplay mechanics and there's no story to garner an investment. Stardew Valley addresses those complaints by adding role-playing systems, a straightforward combat system, and a rich set of well-characterized NPCs. Stardew Valley is a world designed to be explored and has choices which change how you interact with the world. It's open-ended but with curated content, and if fiascos like No Man's Sky have taught us anything in 2016, it's that it's worth to add some direction and authorial intent to games. Stardew Valley is $15, it's a fantastic way to waste some time. This is the police. You're a police chief who's being forced out of office. You gotta put aside $500,000 in six months for retirement, which you can do above board if, and I quote, you net some big fish and hit all your bonuses. It's primarily a police chief sim. Recruit cops, handle their personal stuff, and assign them to crimes. A good performance lets you level up your cops and buy the, the department upgrades. There are dozens of games like that, I'm sure. However, in This is the Police, you're a man who needs money, a man in a dirty town that needs money, and as police chief, you come across things, lucrative things. The mob needs you to look the other way, the mayor needs you to divert resources to help his friends, and sometimes you're at risk if you don't work with the pillars of corrupt communities. These events are unpredictable and keep the sim aspects from dragging on. They're the whole reason I'm here. It's a game with a style like few others, from the visuals to the dialogue. It takes the heart of the private detective pulp novel and pours it perfectly into a police chief game. The feel fits, without ever clashing with the bright stylized visuals. The dialogue is a bit overwrote in places, but I forgive it because it's in service to the exceptional style. Slime Rancher. I've heard a lot of derision about Slime Rancher. That it's a kid's game because it's colorful and not focused on combat and it centers on adorable chubby slimes, which I think we all assume are just hairless tribbles. Slime Rancher might be more accessible for kids than the average game, but all ages is the phrase I'd use. You have to plan ahead to catch the right slime types, make a garden, and avoid tars. Then the market for the florets you get out of the slimes goes down, and you shift to another slime type to keep your money coming in. Do you use largos to collect double plorts and less space but deal with additional difficulties wrangling them? It's a game that requires some real choices. It's not pressuring, but you grind some achievements or to buy stuff. Slime Rancher is about encouraging exploration, taking some risks, and and even making some harsh resource management decisions. The most kiddy thing about it is that it feels like an open world game when it has a very linear design, and that's to focus the player's attention and direct them towards new game elements as they're introduced. A lot of other open world games would do well to have that kind of direction baked in. That's all 10. We try to include indie games of all types. 2016 did not make it easy to just pick 10. Let us know your favorite indie games in the comments below. And remember, if you liked this video, don't forget to subscribe, and if you want to check out other videos made by the Game Domain team, take a look at our other channels. Thanks for watching, see you next time. Hi, and welcome to Game Domain. For this video, we will be counting down the top 10 most anticipated exclusive video games of 2017. Please note that exclusives for every platform and games like Zelda Breath of the Wild are still eligible since being released on the Wii U and the Switch, both made by Nintendo. Same goes for Xbox Play, Anywhere titles. DLC will not be included on this list, so games like Uncharted, Lost Legacy are disqualified even though it's standalone DLC. You're most likely going to have a completely different list than us. This list is just our opinion. This list was made a couple weeks ago, so two games on this list were already released. Number 10. Splatoon 2 for Nintendo Switch. Splatoon 2 is a sequel to the popular and quirky third-person shooter on the Wii U. While a lot of the game mechanics stay the same, there are differences. One is that you're in a new location instead of Inkopolis, and that you could roll if you have a certain weapon type. You could play this game with other people without Wi-Fi locally. Number 9. Xenoblade Chronicles 2 for the Nintendo Switch. Even though we have little info about Xenoblade Chronicles 2, if it's anything like its predecessors, it's going to be great, for sure. 
In the one trailer we've seen, there is an expansive open world, interesting environments, and much more. We don't have a release date yet, but we expect this to release in late 2017. Number 8, God of War. And that's the uh, working title for the PS4 platform. Kratos is back with a very different adventure than it is in previous games. Kratos is now a lot older, and accompanying him on his adventure is his son. Also, this time, there is Norse mythology instead of Greek mythology, so something to mix the game up. The new God of War game is supposed to have a lot of focus on the characters. Number 7, State of Decay 2 for Xbox One. Yet another zombie game on the list, State of Decay is very different than Days Gone. First off, you can play co-op, you even have your own settlement. If you like Fallout 4's settlement mode, I think you're going to like this. State of Decay 2 is a survival RPG that's definitely worth noticing if you're an Xbox One owner. Number 6, Crackdown 3 for Xbox One. Crackdown 3 is going to push the Xbox One to its limits. It features a fully destructible world and an advanced physics engine. Just to get a scope of how big this game truly is, you need to play online to experience the full destructible world because it's how it's going to be connected to multiple servers at once. This is just one of those games that's pretty much guaranteed to be fun because of the sandbox nature of the world and how other games share sandbox features that are actually some of our favorite games we've played. Number 5. Horizon Zero Dawn for PS4. Horizon Zero Dawn comes out very, very soon, and it is shaping up to be a great game. Developed by Guerrilla Games, the developer behind the Killzone series, Zero Dawn is an open world RPG that takes place in a world where machines have taken over and humans have adapted a primal culture. You have to explore the world and meet the different tribes that inhabit it. Also, Zero Dawn has beautiful graphics, and it even looks better on a PS4 Pro. This is a game that I predict is going to be a really fun game, guys. Number 4, Sea of Thieves for Xbox One. Sea of Thieves is basically Pirates of the Game. In its MMORPG, where you play as, you guessed it, a pirate, what makes Sea of Thieves so interesting is that you collect treasure, build up your ship, and even have your own crew. And it doesn't stop there. If you encounter any other pirates, you can attack them. Your crew can betray you, and your ship can be stolen. Number 3, Detroit Become Human for PS4. In Detroit Become Human, you play as multiple androids and you make choices that can heavily affect your experience. The androids can even die if you make choices that lead up to that. During E3 2016, there was a fantastic trailer that showed the many different outcomes of just one event. The graphics and animations are some of the most realistic of all time, especially for console. If you like Heavy Rain or Beyond Two Souls, this is definitely going to be worth picking up. Number 2, Super Mario Odyssey for Nintendo Switch. Before you comment and ask why Mario game is second on the list, hear me out. It's the first open main series Mario game in over 10 years, and there are so many unique environments. There's a modern city, a jungle, and a weird food-based level. Mario has the biggest moveset that he's had in a while, if not ever. Super Mario 3D Land was enough to sell a ton of 3DSs, so imagine how many Nintendo Switches will be sold because of Super Mario Odyssey. Now let's take a look at honorable mentions, Days Gone for PS4. Days Gone is a game you can play as a biker as to take down a huge number of zombies to big environments. In fact, there are so many zombies that you will have to be constantly running and reloading. Number 1. Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, which is a Nintendo Switch exclusive. If we counted Xbox One games that will also be released on Windows 10, there will probably be no Xbox game on this list, so it's only fair to count Breath of the Wild as a Nintendo Switch exclusive. What is there to say about Breath of the Wild that has already been said? There's a gigantic open world that has been made better with the ability to climb almost anything. Breath of the Wild has a very realistic physics engine, so much that there's even physics-based puzzles and ways to attack enemies. If you have metal and there's a storm, you could be struck by lightning. We can make an entire video just explaining the gameplay. Let us know what exclusive games you can't wait to play in 2017 because this year is going to be great for games, guys. You know that for sure. Thank you for watching. Have a great day and goodbye. Hi and welcome to Game Who Made it. In this video, I will be going over my collection of 6th to 8th gen home console games. Um, I think it's on, this is for every platform except for the GameCube, original Xbox, and there might be a PS3 game here. Um, so yeah, that's what that's what it's for, the games. And I do have some GameCube games, but they're not here. Same with the Wii games. I have a lot here, but some are not here. Plus, I have a lot of handheld games also. 
Um, but as I said, home console games. So let's start off with just some sports games. There's an interesting story behind this, which I'll get to um, in a minute. So here's my 360 games, and a lot of them are sports games. So Fallout 3, NHL, NBA, NHL 12, NHL 10, NHL 13, NHL 9. And the reason I have all these sports games on the 360, and I actually have some more, but not here at the moment, um, it's because I went to a game expo, and there was someone just giving away free sports games, a vendor, and I decided to just get some. And, and that's why I recommend going to game expos if you're into collecting, because that's something like that could happen. The one PC game here, Fallout 4. Now my PS2 games, I don't have as many. I don't hear Fallout 2. Madden, NBA Live. Spider-Man for the PS2, Metal Gear Solid 2, Game of Grand Theft Auto, Liberty City Stories. I think I think I Metal Gear Solid 3. I don't know where it is though. I'm sure, it's here somewhere. Okay, so oh, you know I know where it is. I also have Simpsons Hidden Run, but that's not here. We play Mario Power Tennis, Mario Sports Mix. Um, Mario, Super Slugger, and, and, and NHL Slapshot, so a lot of Wii games, a lot of Mario, a lot of, I mean, a lot of sports games, a lot of them are Mario games, some of my favorite sports games of all time, Mario Kart Wii, 2K Sports, Wii Sports Resort, Super Mario All-Stars, this was actually the collector's edition, Mario Strikers Charge, Wario Land Shake It, Super Mario Galaxy 2, um, Mario Sonic the London 2012 Olympic Games, my favorite Mario Sonic game, Wipeout 3, and Punch-Out. I have some more, like, my favorite games of all time, Super Paper Mario and Super Mario Galaxy are not here. I know I, I keep saying that, but, um, they are at different places. Some of my games are at different places, not in my main collection here. So now, some Wii U, PS4, Xbox One, and Switch games, so Elder Scrolls Online. Mario Party 10, We Party You, We Fit You, Star Fox Guard, Mario Tennis Ultra Smash, Random Crossing Amiibo Festival, um, Marin Sonic the Olympic Winter Games 2014, Guitar Hero Live, Assassin's Creed, you know I'm just going to stop reading it, there's so many. Okay, okay, so there's only one stack of games left. And also, I know there wasn't that many, many games for other platforms besides the Wii and Wii U. That's because um, all the other platforms they got fairly recently. And I don't even have a 360, actually. Um, but I do have an Xbox One. And I got the Xbox One, PS4, and PS2 last year. So that's why there wasn't that many games here for it. The Wii U I got in 2013, so that's why there is a lot of games. So anyway, let me know your thoughts about this. Um, what, is, what is your game collection? How many games do you have and for what platforms? This is just for 6th to 8th gen. Um, I do have a decent amount of NES games. And for handheld consoles, I have, I have a lot also. I don't have an SNES or a Nintendo 64. Um, I do have some PS1 games. I do want to get um, some N64 and SNES games um, for my collection. Anyway, thank you for watching. Bye. Hi and welcome to Should You Buy, where we talk about collector's editions for games, consoles, and more before they're released, and give you our opinion on what scenarios you should or should not buy, what we are talking about in the video. 
please note we are not reviewing the game or the product. We are just trying to help make the decision easier for people to decide um, pretty early if they want to get it or not, because I know it can be diff difficult to uh, decide if you want to get something, especially for a collector's edition, which can be very expensive. And as, as you saw in the title, in this video, we will be talking about the collector's editions, editions, not, there's not just one, for Mass Effect Andromeda. There are two versions of it, um, so it's not as bad as some other games, but still. So let's start off with the first. Also, something I think that I think is absolutely ridiculous is that neither come with a copy of, of the game. Um, but luckily, what is in it is actually pretty cool, and it is a good collectible to have. So anyway, the $100 Collector's Editions com comes with a 118 scale diecast model of the Nomad ND1 and a steelbook case that's meant to have the game, but it doesn't. It has doors that actually work, and the interior is detailed. There is also an illuminated dashboard. The $200 Collector's Edition, yes, you heard that right, $200 comes with the same model of the Nomad ND1. However, the Nomad for this can be controlled with a remote, which is your phone. Most people will probably not use it, because this is for the hardcore Mass Effect fan who just wants to add it to their, to their collection. But of course, there will be people who use it, um, not just as a collectible. It has six wheels, it has a front and rear, rear steering, steering, which means... Uh, you can drive it forward or backwards, which is pretty cool. A lot of a lot of remote control cars don't have that, and you can actually control the lights along with everything else. And as I said before, you just use your app, uh, the app for it. Um, you download it to your smartphone, and then you can use it as a remote, which I think is good because it does save money. Because then you would have to pay for the remote. I know it would probably wouldn't be separate, but it costs more to make it then. So that so I think that's always a good idea. And something that I think is the most interesting is that it has a camera that will let you record videos videos and take pictures, and it has a USB charging cable. If you are a casual gamer, I could only recommend this for one reason, and for the 200 one. Uh, so that would only be for a special occasion, occasion such as a birthday or the holidays. That's because, it w that's because it would be a nice gift for younger fans of Mass Effect who may actually use a Nomad ND1 as a toy. If someone is just collecting it, um then they'd pretty much have to be a, a video game collector who does spend a lot of money on it or is just a huge fan of the Mass Effect series. But I would really recommend the $100 version because unless you are, are a huge Mass Effect fan and and uh, if you don't have a ton of extra money, like maybe some extra money, you wouldn't really notice a big difference if it's just the box or even if it's out, out of the box because it's the same model of the car. Okay, so the next one is if you don't care about collecting anything except Mass Effect memorabilia and are a hardcore Mass Effect fan, then I wouldn't really recommend it because it doesn't even come with the game. I don't even think that any collector's edition should be considered a collector's edition unless it actually has a game. If not, then it's just considered a collectible. That's what I think. It should not be called a collector's edition, but that's what it's officially called. Um, but anyway, I would recommend just getting the Super Deluxe Edition if you have $100 to spend on something Mass Effect, because then you're getting all the additional content, um, and you get the game. You don't, you may, you may not get the collectible, you can just wait to get it. Sometimes the price goes down, sometimes the price goes up. Um, so yeah, if you are on a budget, I would recommend getting the game on launch with all the DLC if you have $100 to spend for it. And the next scenario is for a birthday or any special occasion, what version you should get, as I already said before, is the 200 one. It is a gift for younger gamers uh, who like Mass Effect or just want to use it as a toy because this is this seems like a quality remote control car. I know a lot of a, a lot of the more recent ones have not been as quality uh, for a low price, and this is obviously not a low price. Um, so it should be a lot better than some of the cheap ones, and even like the Air Hogs. Like I've gotten a few of them. Um, they <clears throat> they pretty much always break within the first day. I'm not even exaggerating on that. Sometimes they last a, li a little longer, but still, this is a nice quality toy um, or collectible, depending on how you look at it. It's like with Amiibo. Some people consider it collectibles, like I do, and some people consider it a toy that can be used for just as a toy, not as an actual collectible. Uh, um, yeah, so some people won't just put it on their shelves, and for the hardcore fans who have some extra money, I would recommend just getting the Super Deluxe Edition, as I said before, because 
I personally would rather get all the DLC uh, instead of the collectible. If it came with all the DLC and the game, and it was maybe a hundred and fifty, um, maybe, but it's not. And the last scenario for this video, if you are very in in into collecting, and even collect for games you don't like and don't like Mass Effect, this one is difficult for me to recommend or not recommend because that all depends on your budget and if you and if you feel it's worth collecting because I know there are some people who collect pretty much all video game things um but there's some games they don't they just don't want uh want to collect for so anyway remember to subscribe for gaming videos almost every day and if you enjoyed this video rem remember to hit that like button also comment your thoughts on the Andromeda the Andromeda Collector's edition uh, about the Col uh, Andromeda Collector's edition also, I know the series is called Should You Buy, but we're trying to think of a better name and a more original name for it. Please comment if you have any ideas for what the new name could be. If we choose your suggestion, we will we'll give you a shout-out in the next shout-out special. Anyway, thanks for watching. Bye. The 8th generation of gaming has three major home consoles. The Wii U, the PS4, and the Xbox One. Each console has things that are better about it than the other console. Which is why in this video, we will compare the three consoles in different categories. If each console wins one category, then I'll get two points second place, one point, and third place, no points. Number one, exclusives. The Xbox One has not many console exclusives anymore due to many games being available on Windows 10 PCs. Thanks, Microsoft. On Windows 10 slash Xbox One, there are many games like Gear Gears of War 4, Forza Horizon 3, Sunset Overdrive, and Halo 5. There are some great exclusives, but not a lot at all. The PS4 is Uncharted 4, Infamous Second Son, Until Dawn, The Last of Us Remastered, Ratchet and Clank, and many upcoming titles such as The Last of Us Part 2, Death Stranding, Uncharted, The Lost Legacy, Gran Turismo Sport, and remasters of three Crash Bandicoot games. However, the Wii U has Super Mario 3D World, Super Mario Maker, Super Smash Bros, Hyrule Warriors Bayonetta 2, Pikmin 3, Pokena Tournament, Captain Toad, Treasure Tracker, Donkey Kong Country, Tropical Freeze, Mario Kart 8, Splatoon, and the list goes on from there with the Wii U. The Wii U wins this round. The PS4 comes in second, and the Xbox One comes in last. Close, but not so close. Number 2, Online. If we were comparing last gen consoles, Nintendo would lose almost immediately due to the Wii's limited online capabilities. While it's pretty obvious that the Wii U won't win this round, Nintendo has stepped up their game. The eShop has an ever-growing list of virtual console games, some media apps, and Miiverse. The Xbox One has Xbox Live, which has clubs, parties, clip sharing, and many media apps. PSN is a kind of like limited version of Xbox Live. Many features are there, but not really. You still get a lot of media apps and a decent amount of older games, such as PS1 and PS2 games, but it's not the same as Xbox Live. The Xbox One wins this round, PS2 comes in second, and the Wii U comes in last, having the score at Xbox 2, PS4 2, and the Wii U with 2. Number 3, Controllers. The Wii U actually has two representatives for this. It has the Wii U Gamepad and the Wii U Pro Controller. The PS4 has the DualShock 4, and the Xbox One has the Xbox One controller, obviously. First, let's talk about the best thing about each controller. The Wii U gamepad has an entire screen for you to use. The Wii U Pro controller is overall a comfortable controller, modern controller. The DualShock 4 is a huge redesign of the DualShock controller. It has a touchpad and motion controls. However, the triggers are pretty small, and can be very uncomfortable to use, especially in driving games after about a half an hour. The Xbox One controller is the most comfortable out of the three. It takes what Microsoft did with the Xbox 360 controller, but made it a lot better. And it was pretty hard thing to do, considering that a lot of gamers love the Xbox 360 controller. The Xbox One comes in first with this round for, with four, the Wii U comes in second with three, and the PS4 comes in third with two points. However, all controllers are very comfortable. The only reason the DualShock 4 comes in last is because of how small its triggers are. If it wasn't like this, uh, the DualShock 4 may not have 
been in last. Number four, design. For this, we'll be using the design of the PS4 Slim and the Xbox One S. We won't be using the original versions of these consoles. The Xbox One S is a massive improvement from the original Xbox One design. The Xbox One S ditches the VCR design and moves on to a sleeker design. And this time it actually looks nice. And the right side of it has a texture that makes it look like a golf ball, uh, oddly enough. The Wii U has a glossy design and rounded edges that look a lot better than the sharper edges of the Wii. The Wii U is also the smallest of the three. The PS4 has rounded edges, but not as rounded, which looks nicer in my opinion. It has the glossy silver PlayStation logo, and the rest of the console has a matte finish. This run goes to the PS4 with the Wii U in second, and the Xbox One in last. Now, all three consoles have four points. Round five will be the tiebreaker to see who will win. This round is for the console's power. The Wii U has two gigs of DDR3 memory, a tri-core CPU, and an AMD LAT 550 MHz GPU. Now that isn't too impressive. Yes, the Wii U is older than the Xbox One and PS4, but is just as powerful as your smartphone. The PS4 has two gigs of DDR5 memory, an AMD Jaguar 8-core CPU, and an AMD Radeon GPU. The Xbox One has 8 gigs of DDR3 memory, an 8-core Microsoft Custom GPU, and a 853 MHz AMD Radeon GPU. The PS4 and Xbox One are pretty close, but with the enhanced specs here and there, the PS4 does edge out the Xbox One. The PS4 comes in first, the Xbox One in second, and the Wii U comes in third. Now let's take a look at the final score. 6 points for the PS4, 5 points for the Xbox One, and 4 points for the Wii U, making this comparison pretty close. Also, we try not to use any personal bias here, but of course the design comparison is completely based on personal opinion. Also, don't say we let the PS4 win just because we're all fans of Sony. The truth is I own an Xbox One and all the other game domain crew members own the Xbox One, but three of them have it as their second console and the Wii U as their first. Even the crew member who wrote this is a Nintendo fan and actually likes the Wii U better than the PS4 or the Xbox One. Anyway, thank you for watching. If you agree or disagree, please do tell us and remember to write it that in the comments. See you in the next one. Hi and welcome to Game Domain. And for this video, we will be counting down the top 10 upcoming games of the first quarter in 2017. Please note this list is of only games with rec confirmed release dates that are coming out January, February, and March of 2017. Let's get started with number 10, Sniper Elite 4. Sniper Elite 4 releases on PC, PS4, Xbox One, and takes place in Italy, 1943. The maps will be a lot bigger than the maps in Sniper Elite 3, and it will release on February 14th. Number 9, Star Trek Bridge Crew. This will be available on the Vive, PSVR, and the Oculus Rift. It is a very interesting title. The way it works is you have to control something on your starship and make decisions that can make a huge effect on if you'll win or not. Even if you're not a fan of Star Trek, this definitely seems like a game worth picking up if you have a VR headset. It releases on March 14th. Number 8, Yakuza 0. This is yet another PlayStation exclusive. It is in an open world action adventure game designed by Sega, and it takes place in 1988. There have been Yakuza games before, but have taken a long time to get to the US, Europe, but now we're finally getting Yakuza 0 on January 24th. Number 7, Hitman, the complete first season. This comes with all the Hitman episodes of the first season and will release on the PC, PS4, and Xbox One. For those of you who don't know, Hitman is a stealth game where you play as a clone and you can change your outfit to blend in with a crowd. And if you haven't played Hitman yet, I would recommend waiting to get the complete season on January 31st. Number 6, Tom Clancy's Ghost Recon Wildlands. 
It releases on PC, Xbox One, and PS4. Wildlands is an open world tactical shooter where you have to take down the Santa Blanca cartel. You get to choose the gear you want in battle and like other Tom Clancy games you can customize your character. You have a large selection of weapons and transportation and it looks like Wildlands will be a great game. Number 5, Halo Wars 2. It is a real time strategy game and you control a bunch of forces and Halo Wars 2 is supposed to be the biggest Halo Battlefield ever. Also, if you pre-order the Ultimate Edition, you get the definitive edition of Halo Wars. This is also something new called Blitz Command that uses card-based strategy. Halo Wars 2 releases on February 21st. Number 4, For Honor. This will release on PS4, Xbox One, and PC. If you don't know what For Honor is, it's a game where you play as a samurai, a knight, or a viking, and you have to battle the two groups you don't choose. I can't wait to see the multiplayer for this game. Hopefully Ubisoft doesn't mess it up, because this game has a ton of potential. Number 3, Resident Evil 7. It will be available on PS4, Xbox One, and PC, and also PSVR. Yes, it's on PSVR. If you ever played the original, you probably thought it was scary, and that was a long time ago. Now Resident Evil 7 uses photorealism and it's in VR. And first person, I know a lot of people will not be able to play it for in VR for obvious reasons. Anyway, this Resident Evil game is supposed to bring back the game to its roots by bringing back the felling of Clytostrophobia. Sorry if I got that wrong. Resident Evil 7 releases on January 24th. Number 2, Mass Effect Andromeda. Mass Effect makes its return with Andromeda. As the name suggests, Andromeda takes place in the Andromeda Galaxy. And like previous games, you get to customize your squad, explore the galaxy, make different choices, and important ones. Andromeda releases on PC, PS4, and Xbox One. And if the developers are considering it, having it be available on the Switch if enough people want it. And it will be released on March 21st. Number one, Horizon Zero Dawn. This is a PS4 exclusive, but it also has some of the best looking visuals on the system. If you have a PS4 Pro, you'll be able to play in 4K. It takes place in a post-apocalyptic open world where the machines have beat the humans. And it's really difficult to tell that it's post-apocalyptic because the world looks beautiful and vibrant. Horizon Zero Dawn releases on February 28th. If you agree or disagreed to anything on this list, let us know in the comments. And let us know what games you are very hyped for in 2017. Remember to subscribe to Gaming Domain for all things gaming. Thanks for watching. Goodbye. Welcome to Game Domain. In this video, we were at Nintendo New York about one week after the Switch event. We will be looking at the top four mostly the consoles. So, Joe, Joe, right here we have NES uh, and Robin. Show that that remote. Uh, yeah. Let's, wait, which one? I don't know. Like, I know it's a game that Robin uses, and it's like he's yeah. his power to match I, I never, I, I never actually played that remote. Okay, so there we have the SNES. So it doesn't really have any. Have, it doesn't really have any accessories except the controller. I have one of these actually. I have an NES up on there. And here we have a console. I don't think a lot of you have. We have the, the Virtual Boy, released in August 1995. And yeah, the Virtual Boy. Um, now we want to take a look at the screen. It was just a complete failure. Exactly. It was not a good console. Here we have the, the Nintendo 64 with Super, with Super Mario 64, one of my favorite games of all time. I also have one of these. Okay, so now we have the GameCube with Luigi's Mansion. I don't own a GameCube, but I do have some GameCube games though uh, for the Wii. 
Over here we have the way with the Weaver Mode and Nunchuck and Wii Sports Resort it looks like. Is that Wii Sports Resort show? Or no, wait, no, it's Wii Sports. Oh. And we have the Wii U. The Wii U is almost at the end of the flex cam. And here it is with the Nintendo, with the Nintendo Land. And also... What? No, I'm just muting it off. And over here we ha we have an Arwen exclusive statue, which is three hundred dollars. If you want to get a Switch or an Arwen, you have to, you have to make the choice. And we have a Mennonite statue. Now these statues are actually pretty cool, but also pretty pricey. Hello, everybody. Joe here, and I'm going to be reviewing some Nintendo consoles, some Nintendo consoles, and little gadgets for it. So here we have uh, Rob with Gyromite. and Gyromite is actually one of the very few games to use with Rob. Yeah, I think it was only like three games. That yeah, then we got the zappers, other kind of stuff. Then we have the weird stuff. We got the Nintendo, weird zapper. Nintendo Advanced Video System, I don't know what that is. Yeah, we got that, and then we have a weird keyboard. Also, a Nintendo... Track mouse. Yeah, like, what's, what's, it looks like... What's, what's it called again? Uh, a be, a, like a recorder. Yeah, like what a recorder was in the 80s. And we have a QR code reader. What is that? Like a barcode I don't, reader? I don't know. That? that looks like an NES controller. Like a weird yeah. NES controller. Yeah, the NES advantage. I guess that's another controller. Oh, that's like the, that's weird. It looks that's like, like, like a... The, yeah. Oh, there's a Nintendo Power. That's cool. I think they canceled it. Yeah. Okay, the NES Max, NES Four Score, Four Player Module, and the Remote Control Module. And here we have some games. The NES Cleaning Kit. Oh, the NES Classic Edition. Oh yeah, there's look at I've small actually letters. never seen that in person. I've never seen that in person. Yeah, it's extremely small. Yeah, I would really want to get one. Here you have the Golden Glories of Legend of Zelda. Got a lot it. of these games are on. I think all of these games are actually on. Yeah. I think they did that on purpose. Well, that's going to conclude the Nintendo consoles and accessories. See ya. Yeah, so this is a bunch of Pokemon accessories of Pokemon games. There's one on the other side, we'll show you in a minute. So they have the starters, Litten, Poplio, and I forgot what's the name again. I actually uh, forgot the last starter. Oh. Yeah, I haven't played Pokemon Sun in a while. I am. I have some placemats from different Pokemon games. It looks like X and Y. Pikachu, because of course, it, it, what would, well, it's not Pokemon without Pikachu. Um, there's a Sun and Moon lanyard. Sun, a lot of Sun and Moon stuff, a lot of figurines. We got some rare parts. Well, not rare, but like cool. And yeah, so now let's move on to the other side of it. We have um, some of the earlier Pokemon games, Game Boy Advance, Game Boy Color, um, and the DS, and some figurines, and the Game Boy with the pocket. Here we have some Luigi sweatshirts, and Mario, Mario shirts. Mario, like Mario, Mario, yeah, it is Mario Odyssey. Mario Kart 8, Mario Bros. Monopoly. It looks like he's coming out of the sewer. It is Mario Odyssey. Yeah, it's gotta be Mario Odyssey. I can't see that not being a reference. Like, you know how it came out of the sewer? Yeah, and also this is about when we cap it. As I think we mentioned before. Donkey Kong Yahtzee, which I, I know some people use it like a Donkey Kong logo on top of it. Giant Mario World of Nintendo statue. Okay, so here we have um, some of the Skylanders or Imaginators. We have some Amiibo, Amiibo Festival. I actually, have most. I actually have most of these Amiibo except for the Mario Party one. And jo Joe, you have guitar here, right? Yeah, I do. It's pretty fun. I have it on my Xbox One. I have a protector for the Wii gamepad and Zelda 30th anniversary one. Pokémon Tournament Battle Pad. Um. Oh, we can see, we have Wii Remote, so I have Wii Remote, Gamepad stand, and some Pro Controllers. And also the Wii U microphone, which I don't know if anyone actually uses. There's a bunch of Wii U games here, ranging from Mario Party, Captain Spectre Tracker, which is one of my favorite Wii U games. Um, and a lot of games here. I have most of these games, except for the Lego game, Mighty No. 9, Shanty, and a few other games. Then over here we have a couple more Wii U games left, like the City Undercover, which will be on the Switch. I'll be on that. The Pokemon Go Plus, which I would have gotten a few months ago, but I don't play Pokemon Go anymore. That's a download code, and I like that Nintendo does that. Does this like they have the download code for it? Because a lot of people um, prefer to have the actual game, not to download it. Um, and we have a few other 3DS games here. So which games here do you not have? I don't have a lot of these. I don't have Yokai. 
Fashion forward. Um, and there's a bus game, Sonic Boom Fire Ice, and also it comes with a TV show, in case you missed the great TV show with Sonic Boom, here it is. We have some World of Nintendo toys, I, I've been collecting these, I don't have a lot of these. Joe, do you collect the World of Nintendo toys? No, I don't. I have some of them. I mean, I actually got one from a Switch event that I went to, that was so fun. I actually don't think I have any of these, I have a lot, but I don't have any of these. I don't know if I'm getting them though, because they aren't exactly that cheap. Um, and there's a lot of them. And also some here, um, more like, That's cool. Just a little bit of a little bit of a little bit of a little bit Here we have a Donkey Kong girl that you can actually charge your phone in or plug anything into it. And a, a Donkey Kong, a huge Donkey Kong statue. And there's a lot of, there's actually a lot of statues. I remember, I think it looks like a Pikmin statue, but I don't think it's Includes a tour one week after the, the Switch event of Nintendo New York. Anyway, thank you for watching. Bye.